let's look at it from the patient perspective. We talked about clinical trials as being very important to develop drugs, to develop new treatments that will ultimately make a difference for our patients. So why do patients participate in trials? This is a paper that was published about three years ago that asked patients about this. And nearly half the patients participate in trials because they think that this trial or the treatment that's part of the trial is going to help them. And even more importantly, two-thirds of the patients participate in trials for altruistic reasons. They want to be of help. If they can't be helped, they want to help people that come behind them with the same disease. I have taken care of hundreds of patients on clinical trials, and I'm inspired by patients who speak of altruism, who talk about why they're doing it. And it truly is something that you have to see to believe how much people are willing to do to help others. I'm sure I speak for Dr. West as well, are inspired by patients and their families who participate in trials. The other reason patients participate is hope. They hope that this would be better for them. This would be better for their families. This would be better for other people. So patients participate in clinical trials for a number of reasons. There are also certain barriers to participation. Some patients don't like a trial that's randomized. They want to be exposed to a certain promising treatment without having to go through the uncertainty of whether they will get it or not get it. There is also the complexity factor. Some procedures, how they are set up in a trial, may not be easy for a patient to participate in. For example, if the trial requires that a patient comes in three times a week and the patient lives 50, 60 miles from the cancer center, it's going to be hard for them. So that's a barrier to participation. Lack of awareness is another big factor that we have to contend with. Many patients don't know about clinical trials or don't know enough about trials to think of them as worthy options. The presence of placebo group is a very common reason why some patients don't like participating in clinical trials. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But another reason that's commonly cited is a general anxiety and a fear about what this might mean to their health. Now, here are some common myths. I've heard this a lot. You only need a clinical trial when you run out of all standard options. Sometimes patients would come to me after they have gone through three or four different treatments for lung cancer, and their physician told them that, listen, I have run out of options. Now is the time for you to go for a clinical trial. So I want to first dispel that notion to say that clinical trials are typically available for all settings for cancer patients. Somebody with newly diagnosed lung cancer can go on a trial where they are testing a new drug on top of standard therapy. So they're not deprived of standard therapy. They get something on top of standard therapy. So clinical trials are available for all settings. Another common myth is by going on a trial, you might miss out on another standard treatment option. Almost all clinical trials build on standard options. It's never a situation where somebody is exposed to a substandard treatment just because they are on a clinical trial. In other words, if you have a drug, typically the trial would be a group of patients will get the standard treatment. The other group will get the standard treatment plus the new drug. Or they would have to design a trial where the new drug has already demonstrated significant promise that by giving it, you're not compromising on standard treatment. You also have to have the situation where if a treatment doesn't work, then the standard treatment options are available right away. So this is not as big an issue in most instances because standard options are never bypassed in order for a patient to go on a clinical trial. The other factor is I might just be getting a placebo. This is certainly a concern for patients. But it's important to remember that we do not do trials where a placebo is used instead of standard therapy. It's usually added to standard therapy. So if you have an experimental drug and there is a group of patients who get standard therapy plus the experimental drug, The second group will get standard therapy plus placebo. They won't get just placebo alone. So this ensures that every patient in the trial gets standard therapy. Some may get something above and beyond standard therapy, and that's how you find out. Without placebo, you cannot find out if a drug works well or not. So let me give you an example. When Tarsiva was studied, we all knew that Tarsiva causes a skin rash. In a trial, Tarsiva was compared to placebo. And 75% of the patients who got Tarsiva developed a skin rash. That was not surprising. But of the patients who got placebo, 17% developed a skin rash. So this is with placebo. And there, the placebo is actually helping us understand the difference between a drug versus placebo 
placebo plays an important role. Sometimes it's unavoidable in phase three trials, but it is done in a way that it does not affect the standard treatment. There are certain trials done where placebo alone is given, but that's only acceptable when there is no other standard treatment. So the patient has already received all standard treatments and you're testing an experimental drug, their placebo control is allowed. Now, we talked about cost implications in terms of a global level, how much does it cost to conduct a trial, but what does it mean to a patient who is participating in the trial? The first thing is most studies cover all aspects of research. They don't shift the cost to patients themselves. But even within the studies, there are some experimental procedures and some standard procedures. So these standard procedures might be billed to the insurance company because they would be done anyway whether the patient goes on a trial or not. Even though we see this done often, this is carefully reviewed by the institution to make sure that this particular charge that's being made to the insurance would be done anyway whether or not the patient went on a trial. So this goes through careful scrutiny before the cost is billed to the insurance. For Medicare patients, the rules are such that Medicare would pay for any clinical trial patient for standard of care procedures that are part of the clinical trial. And this was a law passed about 15 years ago, which has really made a big difference for our senior citizens to participate in clinical trials. In some instances, trials may also provide patients assistance for things like parking or if they come from far, overnight hotel stay so that they can feel that the logistical hurdles don't impair their ability to participate in the trial. This is obviously very variable from one trial to the other, so it's something you might want to talk to your physicians about. Now, what are the advantages for patients to participate in clinical trials? Well, we can say that there are many studies that over the course of several years shown that patients who participate in clinical trials regardless have better outcomes than patients who do not participate in clinical trials. We think this is because patients on clinical trials are followed more closely, they have very frequent physician visits, and they go through a number of tests that are helpful in treating their disease. But overall, patients who go on clinical trials have better outcomes. Trials also provide access to promising new treatments, and when a patient runs out of standard options, the trial is an option. And finally, participation helps usher in changes for the treatment of the whole cancer as an entity. These are things that patients feel good about participating in trials for. Now, before you go on a trial, there is something called informed consent. This is a document that the physician or the study team will give you. This is probably the most important thing that you want to go through when considering a clinical trial. This describes the trial in length. It provides the reason why the trial is done, what are the risks of participating in the trial, what are the potential benefits, what are the study procedures, how often do you have to come in, how much blood will be drawn if you're going to get through the study, who do you call if there is a problem, what are your options if you don't want to participate in the trial. So it's a very detailed and thorough document, and too detailed that sometimes it runs 20, 30 pages, and that by itself can be difficult to navigate for some patients. But the important thing is you need to take your time to read and understand. Take it home. You should not feel like you're being rushed into a decision. You want to take it home, read it, if you would ask questions with your physicians, if there are things that you're not clear about, talk about this with whoever that is you want to take into confidence so you make the best decision possible for participation in clinical trials. There are a number of rights that are built in into clinical trials for the patients. One is the patient can decline participation at any time during the trial, and they don't have to do anything other than just to call or send a letter to the physician saying, hey, I do not wish to participate. We obviously respect this. We also want to make sure if a patient declines participation in a trial that there are alternative options available for them and that they have access to it. We need to make sure that the patients get access to alternative treatments if they don't want to participate in trial or if they participate in a trial but decide to withdraw at any point during the trial. The patient is entitled to information about all the study treatments, all the risks and potential benefits, and they have the ability to contact the study team for questions at any time during or before or after the trial. So it's important that patients understand this and make use of this information uh, opportunities. Now, where can you find out information about clinical trials? There's a website, clinicaltrials.gov, which is a repository of all the clinical trials. 
You can look at newsletters from institutions or cancer centers have all the trials listed in their website. Organizations like GRACE can guide you to specific clinical trials. You can also talk to your physician asking him or her, hey, do you think there are any good trials that I can participate in? Even if they don't have the trials open at the place where you're being treated or seen, they might be able to refer you to nearest center that can help you with the clinical trial. So finally, we are in an era where not all cancers are same. This is a picture of lung cancer. Each one represents an individual. And if you look at lung cancer, we look at it in very different ways. There are those patients with lung cancer who have an EGFR mutation. There are those who have an ALK translocation. We have patients with a KRAS mutation. Then we have adenocarcinomas. We have small cell squamous. So it's not one disease. It's now increasingly becoming important that we have to recognize what specific subgroups each patients belong to and use that information to design clinical trials that are good for that specific subgroup. In other words, if we have a patient with an EGFR mutation, we want to give them a drug that actually will help with the EGFR mutation. You don't want these patients treated in a trial that involves an ALK inhibitor if there is no biological rationale. So finding the right trial for the right patient is also an important and critical aspect. I want to wrap it up there. I hope I have gone over information that helps you. I'm open to questions, and I want to thank you sincerely for this opportunity to talk to you about clinical trials. And for those of you who have either participated or are considering participation, I want to express our sincere gratitude because it's you who inspire us to do more and do better. Thank you. Thanks for listening. If you like and learn from our GraceCast, you can subscribe on iTunes by just searching for the term Cancer Grace, find podcasts in the subject you want, pick a format of audio or video, and then just click subscribe. It's that easy. And for those of you who don't want to miss any of our programs, there's even a feed for all subjects. You can also find us on YouTube at Grace for Cancer Info. And that's the number four in one word, Grace for Cancer Info. Finally, if you haven't been there yet, please check out our Grace website at www.cancergrace.org. And don't forget that donate button in the upper right. Our content, which helps tens of thousands of cancer patients around the world every month, is made possible by your support.